as Ben has already alluded to, we are in the process of of uh, working our way through a sermon series having to do with the leadership structure at Southfield Christian Fellowship. Now, you know that this sermon series uh, originated with the uh, the work that I've been doing for a doctorate of ministry, ministry degree from uh, Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kansas City. And um, at the beginning, before I, ha- I had ever preached a sermon, today is the fifth in a series of six sermons, uh, but before I had ever preached a sermon, I sent out a survey and asked you for your response having to do with a lot of the topics that we had covered that, that we're covering in the sermon series. All I'm saying is next Sunday afternoon, I'm going to send out the survey again because next Sunday is the last Sunday is the last sermon. And so obviously one of the things that uh, that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to to judge and see how much, how far did I move the needle uh, with the sermon series. And so um, if you receive that, that invitation to do the sermon, again, I would, I would highly, greatly just appreciate you responding to that. Hopefully, if you've, if you've been a part of these sermons, uh, if you have uh, not, if you've looked at the sermon notes uh, in preparation for Life Group, uh, you, you have a better sense of how God has led us to structure leadership at Southfield and to, um, uh, to just to be biblical and to be faithful to what we feel like the Lord has led us to do. The survey takes 15 minutes or less. Uh, and so I, I do appreciate, just telling you in advance, I do appreciate you investing 15 minutes of your time uh, in what the Lord is doing uh, with Southfield, what he's doing with me. Uh, and uh, I, I just really appreciate that in advance. Today, we're going to talk about the bivocational elders leadership. Now, when I was a kid, and, and again, I you know, Stephen family, Stephen Neiman family, honor, otherwise known as honorary citizens of Bronton, Texas. I mean, who wouldn't want that kind of a, that kind of a, of a title? Uh, when I was a kid growing up in Bront, um, my athletic career informally began in grade school, but formally began in junior high. And at the time that I was in junior high, our coaches were big fans of motivational slogans, you know, the, and motivational posters. And typically in those days, they were, it, it was hand printed on a poster board, you know, and it taped up in the locker room somewhere. And a couple of the sayings that I remember were the sayings, you know, when the going gets tough, fill it in, the tough get going. Or uh, winning isn't everything, it's the, it's the only thing. Well, You know, uh, to be honest with you, having a snappy slogan like that didn't necessarily make us better athletes, but it, it, it told us, you know, what they were trying to do. 30 years ago, after I had been pastoring a, a a country church for a few years, uh, Kara and I felt the Lord leading us into uh, a ministry of trying to plant a church. Uh, Let me just say up front, we were royal failures. I was a royal failure in this. Uh, but that's part of how God led me to where I am today. But it was necessary for me when I left the full-time paid position that I had in my country church to, to begin to try to plant this church. I needed to go find a job. And at first, the Lord gave me two part-time jobs, and then eventually the, the two part-time jobs morphed into one full-time job. And I became familiar at that time with something known as successories. How many of you guys have seen a poster like this? Uh, The one on the left talks about teamwork, and it says uh, teamwork is the ability to work together toward a uh, common, I can't even read it from here, toward a common something or other. Uh, But anyway, so, you know, again, it was that same mentality that says if you put words together and you put them up on a wall, it, it casts a vision. Well, just as soon as you become familiar with successories, you become familiar with the work of a website known as demotivator.com. Uh, and that's the poster on the, on the right. Leaders, our burden is to take bold, dramatic actions. Should those fail, your burden is to suffer bold, dramatic consequences. Okay, you know? And in so many ways, I can identify so much more with the, uh, the leader part than the teamwork part. 
but still there is, there is something valuable in having some kind of a verbal cue that helps us to understand what it is that we're trying to do. Now, we have one of these at Southfield. It's called LIT, L-I-T-T, Living by the Word in Loving Community, Initiating Servant Relationships, Talking Persuasively About Jesus Wherever We Go, and Training New and Renewed Believers to Do the Same. Today, we're going to have another verbal cue, and that verbal cue is going to be is going to come out of our, our passage today, 1 Peter 5. How is it that the bivocational elder or any elder is to lead? They are to lead willingly, eagerly, by example, and with anticipation. Willingly, eagerly, by example, and with anticipation. I guess if we been if we wanted a new acrostic, we could call this "we are," you know, something like that. But uh, that's that's what we're going to look at today as we work our way through our passage. Now, as I was doing the work uh, for the for, for the doctorate and getting to a certain place so that I could be in my project, I was already zeroing in on these passages that we've been talking about. But I came across this on Twitter, and I thought it's just a really good description. You see, I say that today is the fifth sermon in this series that I'm preaching. The first sermon had to do with the plurality of pastors. And the idea is that there are three terms that are used for leadership in the New Testament church, and they're used interchangeably. And interestingly enough, the, the term that we are most familiar with, the term pastor, that's the one that is used the least. As a noun, it's only used one time in Ephesians chapter 4. But um, the second sermon, we looked at the character qualities of an elder. And we, we, made the, we, we, we stated the fact that the overall, the, there, there are two overriding character qualities that an elder is to have. One is he has to be a man above reproach. And then two, he has to be faithful at home. And then we talked about the other qualities that Paul talks about to Timothy and to Titus and made the point that many of those character qualities are especially important in the kind of a leadership structure such as what we have at Southfield, which is a team environment. We don't have a senior pastor. We don't have a lead pastor. What we have is we have co-equal pastors who jointly lead the church. And you're going to, when we finish today's passage, you're going to have a better understanding of why that is. All right. The third sermon, we talked about the elder's job description. The elder has two things that he, that he is to do. One, he is to lead, and two, he is to teach. Those are the two crucial things that an elder has to, has to do. Last week then, you'll see that, uh, you'll remember that last week we looked at our passage out of Acts chapter 20. And, and what, this, what this diagram is showing is it's showing the, the three different terms that are used in the New Testament for church leadership. And you see that right there in the middle of our diagram, there are two passages that includes all of these terms, pastor shepherd, bishop overseer, or elder. And that's the passage that we looked at last week, Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 38, and the passage that we're going to look at today, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. So last week when we looked at Acts chapter 20, what we focused in on was the benefit that it is to the church and to the elder when he has an outside job that provides the majority of his support. It keeps him from, it, it, it keeps him from a lot of dangers. And it's good for the church when the elder works an outside job because of the way in which he demonstrates the fact that he is under authority in his job, even as he is exercising authority in the church. Today, we're going to look more at this leadership that we're talking about for the bivocational elder. So let's read our passage, and then I'll show you the, the outline for how we're going to work our way through the passage, and we'll get started. Peter says, and this is at the end of, of his letter to these churches, he says, So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. 
shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. It's a very simple outline for us today. We're going to talk about some preliminary observations that, that Peter makes here in verse 1. We're going to talk about his charge to the elders here at the first part of verse 2. And then we're going to talk about willingly, eagerly, by example, and with anticipation. Let's begin with our, our preliminary observations. So as Peter is, is wrapping up his letter here uh, to these churches in Asia Minor, one of the first things that he is doing is, again, he is identifying himself to his readers. Now, Peter has already identified himself at the beginning of this letter. And that first identification is, he says, you know, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so when Peter says this at the beginning of the letter, he is saying something that is unique to him, but it, it's not something that's common to everybody else. And here in, in verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, he adds a second part to this self-identification. And that is, he says, Peter, a fellow to my fellow elders. And so as we, as we look at this, he says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. As we look at this again, we see that, that Peter is like them in some ways, but he is unlike them in some ways. And when we think about this, we, this is a reminder to us, you know, that when we talk about having a team of pastors who are co-equal and are working together as a team to, to lead the church, that team is not made up of people who are all alike. There are people who have different gifts. There are people who have different abilities. There are people who have had different experiences, different levels of maturity. But what we're going to end up with at the end of this passage is this. All of these men who, who join together to lead the church, they are all under shepherds, under the leadership of the chief shepherd. Say it now. I'll say it again in just a little bit. Who is the pastor of Southfield Christian Fellowship? Who is the senior pastor of Southfield Christian Fellowship? It's Jesus. Ben and I, and Tim when he was a pastor, were only under shepherds. It's Jesus who is the pastor of Southfield Christian Fellowship. So Peter identifies himself both as an apostle of God, but also as a fellow elder with the men that he is going, that he is writing to. And, and understand, part of the significance here is this is the only time that this, that this uh, description, this term, is, is used in Scripture. And so again, what Peter is doing is he is showing, I'm not writing to you from someplace far away, but I am one of you guys, even though in many ways I'm different. So who is it that Peter is writing to? Who is his, his audience? Well, it says that he is writing to, his, to, to, the, to the elders. And, and so when we were looking at this back in the first sermon in this series, we, we looked at the different ways in which the word elder can be used in the New Testament. The, and one of the ways in which it can be used, it can be used to designate those who are elderly. Okay, I fit the description. I fit, I fit the term, all right? It can, it can be used to designate those who are the older men in the congregation. But it's also used to uh, designate members of the council in the book of Revelation, God's heavenly council, the elders around the throne. But there's another use, and that's the one that we're using here in this sermon series and the way in which we use it at Southfield. An elder is simply a man who serves in a leadership role in the congregational assembly. We don't have an age requirement that somebody has to be to be an elder. It doesn't have to be the oldest man in the congregation but they have to be able to meet all of the other requirements, all of the other qualifications that we looked at. Now, these churches that Peter is writing to, um, there are some who think that many of these churches that Peter is writing to are churches that Paul was actually responsible for planting. So even, and, and so Peter and Paul are, are, are both in Rome at this time. Uh, more than likely, Paul is, uh, he, he could be imprisoned for the second time, headed toward his death. And so even here we see this, this sharing of, of ministry responsibility where Peter is looking after churches that Paul is responsible for. 
But when he does this, we, we see this great humility from Peter. Because when Peter is identifying to himself to these churches, he says, I'm a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Well, we know from the Gospels that Peter was, was there when Jesus was arrested. And we know that, that Peter was there when Christ was crucified. What Peter doesn't stay here, but what, what we know and what those who were receiving this letter and reading it know is that Peter failed Christ. When Peter had an opportunity to confess Christ, three times on the night of his betrayal and his arrest, three times G uh, Peter denied Jesus and, he, and he, he fled in shame. The church knew this. By the time that Peter is writing this letter, 30 years or so has passed. And what Peter is doing is he is acknowledging the fact that God has forgiven him of his failure. He's acknowledging his failure, and he's acknowledging that God, that Jesus restored him. We say so many times that the way in which the elders of the New Testament lead is by example. And this is one of the ways in which the elders lead by example. It is by admitting their failures and their weaknesses without glorifying. It is making much of Jesus, but and making little of how evil they were, but, but being honest with others about what their failings have been, where their temptations are, but how Jesus is big in their lives. And so this is what, what Peter is doing with his audience. And then the final thing that we see here in verse 1 is Peter's sense of assurance. He says, I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Peter loves this word glory. He uses it 14 times in, in his writings. But here when he, when he uses the word glory, what he is talking about is he is eagerly anticipating the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ. So in all that Peter has gone through and all that he is going through now, and we know from church history that Peter himself was crucified, but unlike Christ, Peter was not crucified uh, in an upright position, but he asked to be crucified upside down because he did not feel like he was worthy of being crucified in the same way that Jesus was. In all of these things, Peter is able to go through them because he is anticipating the return of Jesus. Somebody asked me when uh, stuff broke out in Israel in October and the, the invasion by Hamas and and all of the bloodshed that took place. Somebody asked me, somebody not here but outside of here, they asked me where this all fit into prophecy. I said, I don't know. I said, but the one thing that I do know, they said, so do you think we're living in the, in the end times? I said, well, of course we are. We've been living in the end times ever since Jesus ascended into heaven because what we're doing now is we're waiting for Jesus to return. And as, and as Peter is waiting for Jesus to return, he has a sense of hope. So in verse 2 then, Peter begins to be very direct with the elders. And what he does here in the first part of verse 2 is he uses a couple of verbs that, that we need to pay attention to. First of all, he says, shepherd the flock of God. Now, again, to, to shepherd means to guide or to care for or to, to look after. One of the things that we need to understand is that when the, the word that Peter is using here, it is the same verb that Jesus used with Peter in John chapter 21. In John chapter 21, Peter is before Jesus, and, and, and Jesus says, says, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter says to Jesus, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And so Jesus said to Peter, tend my sheep. And that's the same thing that Peter is telling, is telling the elders here what they are to do. He is acknowledging the fact that he has failed Jesus. And we know that in John chapter 1 that Jesus restored Peter to fellowship with him. And what Peter is now doing is he is, he is passing along to these elders the same charge that, that he had received from Jesus. 
And this is what we do in our lives with each other as we interact with each other. We share with each other what it is that we have received from Jesus. And so what Peter is doing here, he is, he's, he's taking the word that is typically used as a noun that, that, that literally will give us the term shepherd, but figuratively we use it for the term pastor. And he's repeating what Paul did last week in Acts chapter 20. He is telling these elders, being a pastor is not a laid back lifestyle. Being a pastor is not seeking to be cool. Being a pastor, I forget the website, Ben would know it, uh, the, the website with the, the pastor sneakers or whatever. You know, being a pastor is not seeing how much money you can spend on your sneakers. I'm not saying that because Ben spends a lot of money on his sneakers. It's just that he knows websites better than I do, you know. But uh, what Peter is telling these elders is, shepherd the flock. The flock, pardon me, the flock is smelly. The, f- the flock tends to scatter. The, the, the flock is not always as smart as it ought to be. They don't know to come in out of the rain. So what you are to do as an elder, what you are to do as a pastor, you are to get in there in the middle of them, and you are to be active among them for the sake of God. So the first thing that, that he says here is shepherd the flock. And the second verb that Peter uses here in the first part of chapter of verse 2 is, he says, exercise oversight. And again, here, this, this word for oversight, it's the verbal form of what, of what Paul has been, u- has been using. Uh, and we, we, we've seen this in 1 Timothy and in Titus when he talks about somebody being an overseer. An overseer is somebody who is a steward in the owner's house. And they... they uh, they arrange affairs and they take care of business for the benefit of the owner, of, for the master of the house. And what Peter is doing here, he is using it as a verb, and he is simply saying, elders, always pay attention. Do not ever be fooled into being lackadaisical. Do not ever be lulled to sleep. Do not ever be dull. And again, this is one of the benefits of having a team of pastors. As we work together, as we meet together, as we minister together, keeping one another sharp, keeping one another attentive. And then Peter says, he gives the the disclaimer, he says, shepherd the flock that is among you. Now, the call to pastor, it is always a local call. You know, I, when I was a pastor, young pastor in the country, uh, there were times I was very jealous. I was very jealous of some of my friends, some of my friends who had churches that didn't have the problems that my church had. And so I would, I would just, you know, I'd find myself wishing that I had their church instead of my church. And one of the things that we see in this passage is that it is God who assigns the flock and the pastor to each other. And so... There's not a place for wishing that you had a different church or wishing that you had different peoples or or different problems. You are to pastor the flock that is among you. And so one of the things that I, that I that for me, what, what this means is that, you know, in pastoring the local flock, I am to pastor them rather than to try to build a platform. Let me just share with you guys the awesome social media platform that I am building. Earlier in the series, I was just, I don't know, I was on the website, just kind of just looked to see that the video was up, you know, of, of the sermon and the sermon notes and all of that. And uh, then, I, then I remembered that we have a YouTube channel and the sermons are, are offloaded to, to YouTube. And I was, was telling Ben that week, I said, wow, Ben, when I looked at YouTube, I want you to know I had three views. And then a couple of days later, my, my, the, my, the number of my views doubled. I was up to six, you know. I thought, whoa, man, what a social media star I, I am. And then um, um, you guys remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, Barb had, uh, had her, her brother and sister-in-law uh, in from Iowa. And uh, this was the, the, the sermon having to do with the character of the elder. And uh, when the uh, sermon was over, 
Barbara's sister-in-law came to talk to me out here in the hallway. And, and she was, was complimentary of the sermon, but, but part of what she was saying, part of the reason it hit home for her that day was she and her husband had just left their Methodist church in Iowa because the Methodist church that they're a part of made the decision to remain affiliated with the United Methodist Church instead of going with the global Methodist because of all of the, uh, the controversy having to do with different LGBT uh, theology and, and what the Methodist church is going to do with that. But again, in the context of social media, it was so funny because when she came to talk to me out here in the hallway, the first thing she, said, she asked me was, do you have a podcast? And the reason it was so funny was Barb's sister-in-law is in her 80s. I'm 66, you know, so she's asking, you know, an 80-year-old is asking a late 60-year-old, do you have a podcast? No, I don't have a podcast, you know. The best I can do is give you a copy of the sermon, you know, so... Uh, but anyway, so when, when Peter is saying that, that we are to pastor, it is always a call to a local ministry. And then he gets into the heart of this passage. So here's something that I want you to take a note of as we work through these uh, three of the next four uh, uh, characters or, 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 or exhortations that Peter gives us. First of all, notice that with each of these three, Peter will say something negative first. And then he'll say something positive. He'll say, shepherds, elders, here's how I want you to lead. Not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. And not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Wayne Grudem, in, in his commentary on this, he says, uh, he says, the three distinctives that Peter is referring to here are the antithesis of the vices commonly found in church leaders. Sloth, desire for gain, and lust for power. So let's look at the first of these. How is it that we are to lead? Well, we are to lead willingly. Now, um, so, so Peter says here in 1 Peter ch ch chapter 5, of the, sec the middle part of verse 2, he says... Um, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Now, one of the things we need to understand is that it is very likely that uh, this is still very early in the uh, development of the, New, of the New Testament church's understanding of what the elder ministry is. And so it's very likely that churches were having to draft men to serve as elders. So it may, they may not have been, there may not have been a lot of eager candidates. But, but the other thing that's going on at this time is Peter is writing churches at a time when they are facing friction and they're facing uh, low levels of persecution. They're not facing uh, the, the Roman army. They're not facing the, the, the government of Rome in their persecution. That's going to happen after the turn of the century. But they're facing enough friction that it could be that, that men did not want to lead uh, as an elder because they did not want to be singled out for persecution by their, by their neighbors. So Peter is simply saying it may be necessary to draft men to serve as elders. One of the stories that my father loved to tell about our family was about his oldest brother. Out of all the men from the little town where they grew up in who, who were either drafted or, or volunteered to fight in World War II, my uncle served more time on the front lines than any of the other men from their community. And he was a, he was a sergeant in the Army. And um, uh, he was serving in Italy. He was serving in France. And um, um, my dad said that my uncle had a reputation for two things. And, and see, a, a lot of the combat that my uncle in, engaged in was leading night patrols. Well, my uncle had a reputation for two things. One was he would wear his helmet very low, like a Western gun gunfighter. And because he was from Texas, that's just how he wore his hat. Uh, I remember that's how he wore his hat, you know, and, uh, when I knew him. Uh, he wore his, hat very, his helmet very low. But the other thing he was known for was he brought his men back alive. And so, so many times the, 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 the officers would come to him and they would say, 
Truman, our, our sergeant, or Barbie, or whatever, we, you know, we want to offer you this battlefield commission because they appreciated the fact that he stewarded the lives of his men. In the middle of the war, they sent him home to raise money for war bonds. He had a wife. He had an infant daughter. He goes home. He sees them. He's home for a month, and then he has to go back to fight. And they'd offer him these battlefield commissions, and every time they offered it to him, he turned it down. He says, I don't want it. Why? He says, because I am going home. Officers don't go home. And see, in the church, we may look at that, and we may think, oh, it's not as, as hard being an elder as it is being a sergeant on the front lines in battle. It's even harder. And so one of the things that we need to keep in mind in here is that we must be obedient to Christ. And so if someone fits the qualifications of an elder and the church asks them to be an elder, they seriously need to consider saying yes. And when they do so, they do it with this sense, as Peter says, of doing it willingly. To do it willingly means to do it without a sense of obligation to do it voluntarily, to do it deliberately, to do it in such a way so that no one would ever notice that they had been asked or they had been drafted. Everybody would see the way in which they conducted their service and they would, and they would have the impression this man wanted to do this job. That's what it means to not do it under compulsion, but to do it willingly. The second thing that Peter said to the elders is that they are not to serve for shameful gain, but eagerly. Now, it is possible that at this time that some of the elders may have already been, were in the process of, of being paid for their service. If so, it could be a reference back to uh, Jesus' uh, instructions to the disciples when he sent them out on one of their uh, missionary journeys. He told them to take no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, and then he says this, for the laborer deserves his food. So from the very early days, there's, there's provision in the things that Jesus is saying to, to be able to compensate men for their service. Peter, I mean, Peter, Paul talks about this uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, which we've already talked about. Uh, and, and in 17 and 18, he says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. And so one, one of the things that Peter, that Paul is saying to the New Testament church is that, is that the elders are, they're, they're worthy of having double honor, which is one is honor from the congregation because of the way in which they serve, but also financial compensation. But what Peter says here in verse 2, he says, let them serve um, um, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. When, when Peter talks about shameful gain, the word that he's using, the term that he's using, is a term that has to do with fraud. Has to do with fraud. From my work in the credit union world and, and the little bit that I've done in fraud investigations, here's the one truth of, about fraud. No one ever commits fraud accidentally. No one ever accidentally embezzles money. Fraud is always an act of the will. It's always done deliberately. And so what Peter is telling these, these elders is d protect yourself. Don't have the mindset that serving as an elder is going to lead to financial gain. And don't have the mindset, don't, don't give into the mindset that would cause you to begin to manipulate the congregation in such a way that they would compensate you financially that goes beyond what they can do. So he says, you don't do this for, for shameful gain. And you know, and again, I have that phrase there, this, here's the, the unholy trinity, especially for pastors, money, sex, and power. When a pastor falls, it's always, it's always because of one of these, it's one of these parts of the Trinity, either for, for money, sex, or, or power. 
So Peter tells the elders, don't do it for shameful gain, but do it eagerly. And if necessary, you do it without compensation. When Southfield went to the team of pastors in 1999, um, as part of that transition from having John as the, the full-time senior pastor to John and Tim and I serving as pastors, um, we redid the salary structure. And um, uh, John and I agreed that the church says, okay, here's the, here's the amount of money that we would pay a pastor. And... Um, um, John and I agreed that we would each take one third of that of that portion. Tim says, "I'm not going to take any of it. I'm going to get. I'll, I'll be repaid in heaven." When we so when we went into that into that arrangement through an honest oversight, for the first nine months that we were in that relationship, I did not receive a paycheck. It was just an oversight. John was getting his paychecks. Tim wasn't getting his. Tim was sending his on ahead into heaven. I wasn't getting mine, and and it wasn't that. And 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 I chose not to say anything about it. And it wasn't that I was a, a great Christian martyr. It wasn't that I was exercising some great amount of faith. But I was using that as an opportunity to remind myself that I am serving them. I am serving the church, rather than asking the church to serve me. So when Peter says that elders are to serve with a sense of eagerness, they are to serve others rather than getting others to try to serve them. And an example that we have of, of this in the Old Testament is in Second Chronicles 29, 34, where it was time for the offering of sacrifices. And it says, but the priests were too few and could not flay all the burnt offerings. So until other priests had consecrated themselves, their brothers, the Levites, helped them until the work was finished. For the Levites were more upright in heart than the priests in, conserv in consecrating themselves. Paul has already said elders should be, should be fairly compensated. But the nice thing about the bivocational approach is it helps to protect us from many of the dangers that we might fall prey to otherwise. And then the final thing that Peter says to the elders, he says that they are not to domineer over those in their charge, but to be examples. To domineer means to gain power, to gain power over somebody or something, to overpower and to be and to subdue them, and to do so so that it is for their advantage. I've been involved in organizations where men sat on board of trustees, and I looked at the decisions that were made by the board for this organization to fulfill, and it was obvious that many of the board members were doing things that would benefit them rather than the organization. Peter says, don't do that. This is what Jesus dealt with in Mark chapter 10 when, when James and John had their mother appeal to Jesus, you know, for her sons to sit on, to sit on his right and his left hand and, and to give him places of power in the new kingdom. Uh, this is what, you know, we have an example of what this, this same word is used in Acts chapter 19 when we're told that the seven sons of Sceva tried to uh, cast a demon out of a man uh, and it says that the man overpowered them and, and uh, struck them and, and they, they fled from the house uh, naked and, and, and fleeing. Um, we're not to do that as elders. To be an elder means that to, to, to be an example to the flock, the, the word that's used there is an example. It's the word that comes from what happens when you strike something and you leave an indentation. You leave a mark. You know, in a little while, we'll hear Iris's uh, salvation testimony prior to baptism. And one of the things that I like to talk about in, in baptism, and I like to talk about it in weddings, is, you know, I have a wedding ring that I wear that is simply ju just a, an outward symbol of the relationship, the covenant relationship that I entered into with Kara in 1984. If I take this ring off, I'm still married to Kara. I'm still in that covenant relationship. And one of the things that happens is from time to time when I do take the ring off because of the work that I'm doing or something else, it always leaves an invitation in my, on my finger to remind me that Kara and I are married and that I am in an exclusive covenant relationship with her. 
Thomas did not necessarily believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And so Thomas said, I'm not going to believe it until I stick my hands, my fingers, into the holes in his hands and into his side. Peter, Paul told the Philippians, he said, I want you guys to um, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on, the, on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So willingly, eagerly, by example, and then finally, with anticipation. Here in, in, in verse 4, Peter says, When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Who is the chief shepherd of Southfield Christian Fellowship? Jesus. Ben and I are just under shepherds. What I love about this, again, is that as shepherds, Ben and I are called to exercise oversight. We are called to shepherd as a verb. All of it in relation to the chief shepherd who is the noun. And see, that's just, that's just indicative of, of how it is that, that all of us as believers are to live our lives. Our lives, the, the, the actions, the activities of our lives, everything we do is in response to who Jesus is. We begin with who he is. And then, we, and then we live accordingly. And our reward is going to come. It's going to come. You know, Tim said, I'm not going to take my paycheck. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait and receive it in heaven. Tim is assured that he is going to be compensated for 20 years of faithful service in Southwood Christian Fellowship. Let's talk about some applications that we can make out of this. The first one that I want to say is that when we serve, we are to serve voluntarily and with enthusiasm. Um, if Southfield Christian Fellowship were to ask you to be an elder and it wasn't your idea, I want you to consider it. I want you to consider it and I want you to think about Nehemiah chapter 8 as to how you would do that. That you would do it according to the joy of the Lord. That that would be your strength. You see, in Nehemiah chapter 8, as the people have been rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, the time comes that they're going to read the Word of God. And Ezra the scribe goes up on the, on the platform to begin reading the law. And, and understand that, this, that, that the word of the, of the law, it had been neglected. It had been ignored. And as Ezra read and as the other, me, other men began to give interpretation, the people began to weep. When was the last time that you and I wept? Because we had neglected the word of God, not just missed a morning devotional. When have you and I wept because... God has convicted us of, of the overwhelming nature of our sin and how, how easy it is that we forgive ourselves and say, oh, that's okay, God knows what I meant. When the reality is that these are the sins that Jesus died for. When have we wept? And Nehemiah told the people, he says, he says don't weep. He said, go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the application here is, if, if, if you are asked to serve as an elder at Southfield, do so in the joy of the Lord. But again, the feedback that I get, and Ben is alluding to some of this, the feedback that I get is, okay, I'm not going to be an elder variety of different reasons. What's in this sermon series for me? What's in this for us is this. Each one of us as a follower of Christ, we are called, and one of the things that we bound ourselves to here at Southfield Christian Fellowship in, in living out the lit lifestyle is we, we have a, we have a, a, we've committed ourselves to doing the I in lit, to initiate servant relationships. The problem with being a servant is when other people treat you like a servant. Is when they expect you to care for them and to do things for them. Enter joyfully into that relationship and stay in that relationship through the joy 
of the Lord. The second application that I would say is this, that we are to look to give rather than to get. Every Christian is called to live for Christ and not for themselves. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he said, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died and for all, and therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. If you serve as an elder at Southfield Christian Fellowship, understand that the church will compensate you at some level. Southfield is very generous, and Southfield is wants to take care of the men who serve, the men who lead. But here's the reality. The reality is, is that no church can ever fully compensate a pastor for who he is and what he does. Because no church fully understands what it costs these men to devote their lives to caring for God's flock. God's flock. Churches should be as generous as they possibly can according to their ability and according to their resources. But if you receive a salary from the church, be grateful for what the church can do. Be grateful because the church loves you and the church is, is helping to take care of you. When I went my nine months without a paycheck, again, it was no great act of faith. Been in Southfield for five years at this time. I knew the character of Southfield. I knew that one day I would receive a check and, and I would get all of my pay. And that's exactly what happened. You know, Tim, again, chose not to take a paycheck. And it wasn't that Tim was, was standing up before us and saying, oh, look at how great I am. Look at how whole I am. Look at how full of faith I am. What Tim was doing, and I'll put words in his mouth, but what he was doing was he was serving as a living example in front of us of what it means to look to Jesus to be your source than to look at the people whom you serve to be your your source. And so when we're serving in leadership, we need to keep that in mind. So what's in it for the rest of us? All right, let me warn you, I'm going to step on some toes here. We are blessed. We are blessed to have a number of young couples who have met, chosen each other, going through the process of, of getting ready for marriage. One of the most selfish things that you can do One of the most harmful things that you could do for your future spouse is to engage in a sexual relationship with them while you're dating, while you're engaged. You say, oh, when I get into marriage, I'm, into marriage, I'm going to be faithful. I'm not going to be an adulterer. Well, then don't be a fornicator. If you want to protect your future marriage, Refrain from sex before marriage. Live to give rather than to get. And then some of you will say, it's not a problem for me. I'm not engaged. I'm not even married. I'm not even dating anybody. Okay, look at the relationships that you have now. In the relationships that you have now, how are you looking to give rather than to get? You see, the, it, it, this is the thing that I've been saying as we've gone through this. So many of these things that apply to elders, they apply to all of us. It's not a difference in kind. It's just a difference in degree. All of us need to live with each other, seeking to give to each other rather than to take away from each other. Our next application is to lead others by example. I was looking for a really snappy illustration here. I was really trying hard. And I pulled a book off my bookshelf uh, that I had remembered reading a number of years ago. 
And I thought I remembered a story that was in the book, and it was going to be a perfect story. Couldn't find it. Couldn't find the story. As I was putting the book back on the bookshelf, I looked on the back cover. Now, the, the, the purpose for this book, the author says, I've written this book to do this, to confront the issue of the often unhealthy shape of pastoral culture and to put on the table the temptations that are either unique to or intensified by pastoral ministry. This was a book specifically written for pastors. And on the back of this book, there were five endorsements. Three of those men are no longer in ministry. One of them decided that in a bit of frustration with his wife, that he was going to expose the fact that she had been unfaithful to him. She, in turn, exposed his infidelities. Disqualified from ministry, out of the pulpit. Second man had grown a large church and a series of churches and had a nationwide ministry and a large radio presence until his elders finally acted on the fact that he abused power and legitimately threatened to murder members of his family, removed from ministry. The third man repudiated everything he had ever done in the faith divorced his wife, and walked away from the faith. Now, those are high-profile flameouts. Brothers and sisters, you and I have the capability of having the same kind of effect on the people that we are around in South Hill Christian Fellowship. In the West, we are under the mistaken impression that discipleship is always one-on-one. -on -one. It, it, it is one-on-one, -on -one, but it's not limited to one-on-one. -on -one. Discipleship is also a group process. As you go to life group and you participate in life group, as you participate in your lip groups, I want you to understand how it is, what the impact is that you're having on the people who, who are around you. And be mindful of how you want to encourage them to follow Christ. I'm not saying put on a fake air. I'm not saying to be false. But the best thing that you can do is to show that you are open to counsel, that you are accountable, accountable to believers who love you and who, have, who invest in you, and to realize that you have an effect that you may not be aware of. Our final application is this, that we are to wait expectantly with great joy. When Kara's mother came to live with us, seven years ago. It was our intention that she would live with us until she died, that this would be the last move that she would make. And she lived with us for three years. But at the end of the three years, it just became apparent that we were not able to give her the kind of care that she needed. And so she agreed and moved into a facility. Now, unfortunately, Right after, time, right after she was moving in, COVID happened, and she was stranded in a room on the back side of the building, very little interaction with anybody. We couldn't get in, and even the staff there were limited in what they could do for her. She was mad. She was mad. COVID finally came to an end, and she was able to move to a different location that was much more in the center of the, of the building, and she was such a, a social person that she, she loved it much better. During the seven years that she was with us, there were, there were many medical emergencies. There were falls, there were trips to the, to the ER, there were stays in uh, skilled nursing facilities and all kinds of things, like there were two or three bouts of COVID. But every time that, that we had, we had an, a, an episode, you know, Kara and I would be like, okay, is this it? Is this what is going to finally take her home? It never was. And in talking with the doctors, the doctors would tell Kara, okay, nothing wrong with her. She's fine. You know, like, really? <laughs> she's fine. Yeah, she's fine. Until last January. Last January, she took a fall that, that incapacitated her, finally. 
and it increased the amount of dementia that she was dealing with. And then on Halloween Day, she took another fall. And it was two weeks after that that she went to be with the Lord. As we look back over these seven years, with the perspective that we have now, it's easy for us to say, okay, this was significant, that wasn't, that wasn't, that wasn't. This was significant, that wasn't, that wasn't, that wasn't. It's easy now, from this perspective, to see what those transition points were. But when we were in the middle of them, we couldn't tell. Brothers and sisters, we are waiting for Jesus to return. When he returns, we will receive whatever the reward is that he is going to give us. But until then, we continue to serve in spite of not knowing exactly how close to the end we are. So Paul gives us the encouragement here in Galatians chapter 6 as to how we ought to live during these days. He says, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So because of the way in which Kara lived this way with her mother, with her mother no longer with us, Kara is sad. But she has no regrets. Because when she had the opportunity to serve, she served. You and I have the opportunity to serve one another now. Let's take advantage of it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for your word. Father, we want to thank you for your goodness to us. Father, we want to thank you that you have called us to walk with you and to, and to be your children. Uh, Father, we recognize that none of us, none of us are, are perfect or faultless. But, Father, we pray that you, we would continue to walk in that sense of forgiveness that you've given us. May Jesus be glorified. May he be big in our lives in every way in the name of Jesus. Amen.